In this session, we'll cover the changes that were introduced into Capture 121 as part of their 21.3 update. Now, if you own a perpetual license of version 21, then this is a free update for you. Equally, if you're on the subscription model, then you can just go to capture1.com and download the latest version. This version, if you go to the About screen in Capture One, it's actually going to say it's version 14.3. That is the same as version 21.3. If it says that, you're running the latest copy. Now, in here are a couple of brand new features, but you're also going to find a couple of things that have been changed under the hood. We'll cover all of those in this session, but we're going to start with the first feature, which is Magic Brush. Now, for a long time, when we've come to masking areas such as this, we've been able to refine how we mask things by choosing either a color range in our color editor, so we could choose this blue here and then create a mask layer from that selection. Or we could take an existing mask and say, actually, out of that mask, I only want to identify and, and store in that mask certain ranges of brightness or luminosity using a luma range. Well, in 21.3, they've introduced a new feature called Magic Brush. And the Magic Brush is almost like a hybrid of those plus some extra bits. And what it allows us to do is to select similar pixels, whether that's based on brightness or color or, or whether they're uh, neighboring pixels, with some options to hopefully make creating masks around quite complex objects and, and subjects a lot easier. Now, in order to accommodate for Magic Brush in this toolbox here, unfortunately, there's a few changes to the interface which you're going to have to get used to. So the first is that the Layer, Add and Remove function has moved from down here on the bottom left to up here just above the other tools. The second is the Mask Visibility tool has moved up to the top here above the viewer rather than being on the layer itself. So with those changes done, it means that there's extra space for the Magic Brush. And the Magic Brush itself, you just click on here and you're going to get something that looks very similar to a normal brush setting. But if I right click on the Magic Brush, I'm going to get these different variables that I can set. So the first is size and opacity. Obviously, we're used to those, so how big and, and how opaque the, uh, the mask that I'm drawing is going to be. But the next is tolerance. So tolerance dictates effectively how similar the neighboring pixel needs to be in order to be included in the, the range that we're painting. And the next one is the refine edge, and we'll come on to that in a bit more detail later on. But effectively, now as part of Magic Brush, with every brush stroke, I've got the ability to have a different edge refinement based on what I'm actually painting. And then on top of all of those, we've got this sort of master variable here, which is sample entire photo, which we'll cover in a second. So let's imagine we want to choose this sky. Well, with our new magic brush function, I'm going to choose a relatively low tolerance. Uh, we're also going to choose, oh, we'll leave the refine edge to its default. 100% opacity is fine. The size is more important for the size that I need to pick inside of. So imagine if I was choosing inside these cables here, I might want a smaller brush to be able to do that. Um, out here, it doesn't really matter too much. We can have a much bigger brush if we want. So I'm going to leave this off so that you can see the difference in a second. And we're just going to paint across this sky. Now, the first time you paint, it's going to calculate the mask. And that's creating a huge raw mask in memory to uh, be able to do everything from now on in a much more speedy fashion. Now, these are 150 megapixel files. On smaller files, that's a lot quicker, but it's a first time uh, process that has to happen whenever we start to use the magic brush. Now, as you'll see in here, it's only selected a certain proportion of the sky, and that's based on two things here. The first is our tolerance, because we've limited it to only 31. And the second is we don't have sample entire photo enabled. So in other words, it's only going to go to its neighboring pixels as long as there's no break or something in the way from the next set of pixels, for instance, inside these cables here on the Golden Gate. So if I wanted to get all of these in one go, let's just undo all that mask work here. And this time I'm going to choose sample entire photo. I'm going to leave my tolerance where it is and the refine edge where it is. I'm going to choose the same sky. And this time with that tolerance, yes, it's stopped here because there's a difference between these pixels and up here. It was quite a big difference in, in brightness. But it has masked inside our cables here. And this softness around the cables is down to this refine edge that we've got in our mask settings here. So if I wanted to include more of the stuff inside the cables, well, we just go back to our magic brush, click into here, and it's going to start doing that. But you're also going to find that not only is it including the stuff inside the cables, which matches the sky, it's also picking up down here 
on the water because that's a very similar color as well and with our tolerance set to a relatively high amount it means that it's able to spill out over certain areas too so overall be careful with the subjects that you're choosing this mask effectively works in exactly the same way as any other mask i can go into the eraser and i can remove the stuff that i don't want but it's an additive tool so magic brush at the moment can only add to an existing mask or its own mask it will not erase. You don't have a minus magic brush function as it stands right now. One thing to bear in mind, if at the moment we're, we're painting on an existing adjustment layer, if I didn't have an adjustment layer and I chose my magic brush, it will automatically create a brand new brush layer for me too. So what if we wanted to be a little more accurate in terms of this mask? Well, let's clear this mask down. And I'm gonna decide, because I don't want to actually sample the entire photo, um, we just want to sample the area in front of me and I'm going to choose to increase our tolerance a little bit and choose our Golden Gate Bridge. And you'll see that by using this additive brush, we're adding and adding and adding to our mask each time to increase our selection. If it goes wrong here, well, we can just undo that step. So Command Z or, or press the undo button and you're going to get to a pretty accurate mask pretty quickly through using the magic brush function. So as long as I stay to the iron work, um, we're able to do that. Now, one advantage here is unlike with a Luma range or a color selection, magic brush doesn't actually care what color you're choosing. What it's looking for is similarity. Now it's using color and it's using luminosity to determine that. But you can see here selections that I couldn't have made with a color selector if I turn my mask off. You know, we've got whites, we've got reds, we've got yellows, we've got everything in here. I couldn't do it with that. I couldn't do it with a Luma range because my luminosity is very similar between these areas. But Magic Brush is able to identify the areas that need to be selected because they're similar to the area that I've chosen. So that's in terms of our overall photo ord or uh, not allowing uh, Magic Brush to spill out across the entire photo here. What about the Refine Edge? So let's have a look at this example down here. One thing you've always been able to do with any mask, of course, is to use the refine mask function here on the layer. So let's just draw with our magic brush now. Um, we're going to say not sample entire photo. We're going to leave the tolerance, well, relatively high actually, and put a reasonable size on. And I'm just going to draw across the sky. You saw very quickly that auto mask uh, function came up and what it's doing is it's just working out a mask map for this image so that everything I do from now on is a lot quicker. Now this was too much, we can see, because it's covered some of the, uh, the rock face as well. So I'm gonna undo that and I'm gonna change my tolerance down and we're gonna do the same drawing across there, a much better mask. And as I draw across these areas here and expand on that area, I get a nice clean setup around these rocks, these mountains, um, and the trees and so on. But let's have a look up here at these trees. And we can see in here that the trees have got a little bit of a jagged edge. Now this was always what Refine Edge was for. So I can go into here, go to Refine Mask, and I can soften the edge, or using the radius, from very binary to very soft and using similar edges um, or, or similar tones and so on either side of that mask area. But with Magic Brush, I don't have to do it at a global level. I can actually do it at an individual stroke level. So with that area up there masked, and what we had was a relatively low refine edge of 16, let's have a look at maybe these parts in the foreground here. Let's just lift up our, uh, our foreground so we can see it a bit clearer. So with our Magic Brush, I can choose this area here of grass on a rock and we're gonna leave our tolerance quite low and we're gonna leave our refine edge relatively low too. And I'm just gonna draw a nice little mask across there. I'm gonna turn on, well in fact we've already got it, but if I wanted to turn on the mask, remember we've got to look up here now instead of down here to see it. And we can see that that's got a relatively broad spread because of those two variables, tolerance and refine edge have allowed the mask to spill out and cover a lot more area. If I wanted a very, very specific mask over this piece of grass on the rock, well, I'd use a slightly different setup. So I'd pull my tolerance in maybe. But if I bring my refine edge to be a lot, lot sharper and draw, you're going to see it's a lot more digital, a lot more binary. We don't have those sort of soft fall-offs here. We have a very binary on or off 
um, effect on this, this mask itself. And if I change my mask to show us the grayscale mask instead, we can see that difference of an edge which has been refined and an edge which has been unrefined or very sharpened um, from the point that it was drawn. So this new feature in, in terms of Magic Brush has, rather ironically, a bit of a byproduct which can be very interesting for us. Historically, the refine mask function was only at an entire layer level. So we'd go to refine mask and we'd take the entire layer and we'd have a mask that was refined on its edges and feathered based on the entire layer property. Well, instead now, I can actually have, let's go into our magic brush here on this tree and put a really soft edge on this tree and draw just across these colors here. Great. Now let's look at my grayscale mask. And we can see we've got this really soft fall off on this part of the mask that I drew. So in the same layer with that magic brush, I've got some areas up here which are the default um, refine edge. We've got an area here which is a bit softer, an area here which is very binary, a lot harder, and an area here which is very, very soft. And all of them were done at an individual brush stroke level rather than being done as an overall layer. So overall, Magic Brush is going to help some people in terms of what they, um, what they, they struggle with in terms of masking, especially around some complex objects. It does allow us to have some great variables in terms of one area of the mask being very sharp and very defined, one area being softer, one area being very soft and falling off. There are some limitations. So as I said already, we can't erase very, um, very magically, let's, let's put it that way, from the mask. It's an additive tool. We can only add to it using the magic brush. If I erase, we're back to the standard eraser, which is just a very blunt tool just to erase any stuff that we don't want. So the magic brush itself is additive. It's intelligent in terms of it's able to know whether you want to sample the entire photograph or whether you want to change um, an individual area, for instance, in our Golden Gate shot here. And it's got the ability on each brush stroke to have a different effect applied in terms of its edges and its tolerance. So we've drawn our masks. We've uh, made some changes to our picture. Um, let's say we want to export it. Now, traditionally, we'd go up here on the top left, and there used to be a cogwheel there for process recipes. This is actually quite confusing to a lot of people because there were several ways of exporting an image. You could right click and go to export, and then you could choose some settings here. You could click on the export button up here, or you could click on the process recipe up here, which was effectively our soft proofing function at all times within Capture One. All of that lot and all of those functions have now been combined into one area, which is the new export tool. So whether you go here to your export function or click up here, you're going to get to the same place, which is the new export images tool. Now in here, those of you that are used to seeing export recipes or process recipes, you're going to find this very, very, very similar. So the process recipes themselves they haven't moved. Um, the defaults are in there. If you've deleted any by accident, you can hold down on the plus button and you can put in the, the built-in recipes um, back to where they were before. But the process recipes used to confuse a lot of people because, yes, it was really useful for soft proofing. For example, I could see exactly what was going to come out if I went to a grayscale output um, based on the ICC profile. But it also confused people in terms of these locations, the subfolders, the what to do with existing files because we weren't able to necessarily add or, or overwrite. So that's all been refined into one big dialog box now with the process recipes and the export functions, very similar to our import function in terms of its, its viewer layout, but in a much more simplified way. So we still have process recipes. I can choose these and it's going to automatically fill in the options and variables that I chose for my format, the size, how the image is going to be named. But the location and naming have now been massively simplified from where they used to be with all of the tokens and, and per um, image naming and, and so on. Every single location now is linked to the recipe itself and the naming structure has got a lot more simple. So let me show you. When you first go into the export viewer, you're going to find that this folder here is empty and it says choose. That's because we haven't set a default folder and this is now the root folder for all exports based on not choosing anything different. So if I choose this as my export folder, 
this now, because I've set it as my primary folder, is going to apply to every recipe that didn't have a folder set. If I decide to change my mind in terms of where that default is going to be, well, I can click on this little one with a cogwheel and it'll ask me do I want to change the default output folder. But I don't have to stick with the default folder for each of these recipes. I can say same as original file or choose folder. So I could choose in this case, maybe an Asia folder, and that's going to apply to only this recipe. So if I don't change anything and I leave it as the default after I've set it, that default is going to apply to every single recipe as the root folder for any export. If I do set it as a root folder for a recipe, it's going to save it for that process recipe. And I've also got the option of having a subfolder in there. So quite often we'd always have them into a default output folder, but then maybe a subfolder per recipe. So we'll call this one JPEG 2048. And this one could be, well, as it is, Adobe TIFF. So if I chose both of these recipes and say I want to export this image as both an Adobe RGB TIFF and a 2000 pixel wide JPEG, it will put the TIFF into the TIFF folder or the subfolder and the JPEG into this JPEG 2048 folder, both within the default folder. If I wanted them in their own folder, specifically for this, or this recipe itself, you'd just choose choose folder, or you can choose same as original file. Here's a fun one, the existing files. Now I know a lot of people have been frustrated by this. This is now allowing us to either add a suffix. So if I have a file that's the same name, it's gonna append a number onto the end of it or overwrite or skip it. So in other words, if I want to re-export um, only new files, we can choose to skip the ones that I already have out of a batch, and it'll only add on the new ones that didn't exist in that folder. So those are some really handy um, changes to how it treats existing files, because I know that was really painful before. For those of you looking for the original options in all of your other um, settings, they're down here. If you click on Show All Options, you're going to find that all the adjustments in there for crop and sharpening also your watermark settings, any metadata and so on, that's all in there and it's down again per recipe. So you can choose at a recipe level how you want to display the watermark, what crops you want and so on. But by default, that's hidden now. So we keep this nice and clean. And all we're asking you to choose is your default folder for output and choose a subfolder if you want to stick with the defaults that come out of Capture One. Create a new recipe, it's exactly the same as before. If you hold down on this plus button, you get the choice of the defaults that came with Capture One. If you short click on that plus button, we can create a new recipe and put in all my settings here. But if you're creating a new recipe, don't forget to go to show all options so that you can choose if you have any crop or sharpening or watermark and so on too. It's not missing, it's just hidden by default down there. So overall, that's a pretty nice um, improvement in terms of the interface, in terms of how we can export files out of Capture One. There's also a slightly easier way if, if you've already chosen. So let's go back into my export dialog and say, I want to export this one as a JPEG and a TIFF and my new recipe. And I've done that already on this picture. I can go to another picture. And if I click and hold, I can choose this export with previous settings and it will use whatever settings I used before and produce it again. Of course, you've got a uh, shortcut of Command D or Control D. So that's the new exporter. When you first go into Capture One as, as the new 21.3 version of Capture One, you may find a little warning that pops up and that's just to tell you that by the way, the cog no longer exists in the top tabs. And now to do your exports, it's just all moved to this new export dialog box up here. So with the overwrite files and the suffix files, that makes for exporting a lot easier because no longer do we have to worry about putting them into a, as I used to, a dummy folder and then move them across and, and control the overwriting from there. But what about actually catalog management? And that's also now been improved in terms of where we can find our files. All of a sudden now you're going to see these bigger numbers. And the reason is because finally we now have subfolder counts for images. So if I go into, for instance, this Europe um, folder here, that doesn't reference the fact there are 529 images in this root folder, which is how Capture One used to behave. It now references the fact that if I add up all of these subfolders, that all comes to 529. So we've now got nested image counts for all those subfolders. 
If you don't like it, if you prefer the existing way of working, you can hide the number of images and subfolders and it will tell me in this one we have none, uh, this one 47, this one 14 and so on. Um, but for most people, I think they're going to find it more valuable to say show images and subfolders and that's going to allow us to see at a rolled up level how many images we have in every folder underneath that root. Also for catalog users, um, with sessions this was obviously a lot easier because it was constantly synchronizing, but for catalog users, if you added a new folder or a subfolder or even some images into one of your existing folders, it could be really painful to try and uh, synchronize it and incorporate it. You'd almost have to go into each individual level. Now I don't. So if I added, let's say, a new uh, folder in here under North America, which I did earlier, if I right click here and go to synchronize, Capture One is going to do a quick scan from the main folder and it's going to say, do you want to synchronize including subfolders or just the main folder? In this case, I want to include subfolders. I can choose to exclude anything new, so only scan in the existing imported folders. But in this case, I want it to go outside of that. And it'll actually give me a preview and say, well, I've actually found already seven new images in those subfolders already. And we've got the option of showing the importer, so I can do that same uh, process when I import um, at this point here. But if I click Sync, you're going to find all of a sudden Capture One does a little bit of a, uh, a recheck, and it finds here a new set of images in this brand new folder here. We'll find my count goes up because we've got another seven images in here. And that's a much cleaner way of keeping catalog data synchronized um, between um, the Finder folders or the, the Windows Explorer folders and your catalog within Capture One because quite often they'd become a little bit out of sync. So Synchronize does exactly what it says, but the beauty of it is you can now do it at a higher level and use that nested folder option to include new images in extra subfolders that Capture One finds. And as you saw, it's pretty quick at doing it too. So those are pretty much the three biggest changes that you're going to see in, in 21.3 for most users. We've got our magic brush, which has resulted in a few things moving around, but more importantly, a much, much easier way of creating very complex masks, additive masks, not just based on color range or luma range, but a bit more uh, intelligence in terms of neighboring pixels and what's very similar. On top of that, we've got the brand new exporter. So the exporter has been simplified. It's all in one place now. So your process recipes and your actual export function are all in the same window. And we've still kept all of the existing um, flexibility that you had before, but it's just in a much neater sp space um, on your screen. And we've now got the, if you're using catalogs, the ability to have a folder hierarchy that's nested in terms of its image count and the ability to synchronize multiple subfolders at the same time, which saves a lot of time. You're also going to find in Capture 121, there are some extra functions for Fuji users. So if you ever shoot tethered um, for Fuji users, you're now able to trigger a shot while you're in live view. So that was previously a bit of an issue. And for certain Leica owners, so if you own certain Leica cameras and, and lenses, you're now able to nudge the focus um, when you're in uh, live view too. That's that's really handy feature. I've, I've used it quite a bit um, with, with other cameras, but... Um, to bring that to a new set of cameras is quite cool too. If you go hunting, you may also find this down here, the Capture One Live Beta. Um, this isn't yet there. It, it's sort of laying the groundworks. And this is a way of, in the future, being able to link out to other people to be able to view Capture One data. Don't worry about it too much right now. Um, but as it stands, that's laying the foundations for hopefully a really cool service to come. And that's it. That's your 21.3 or 14.3 update. Hopefully there are features in there that some of you will get some big advantages from. Certainly when you're drawing masks, Magic Brush can be a help. Don't try and use it in certain uh, ways. I'll give you an example. Um, so in this image here, if I use Magic Brush here to, let's just choose a reasonable tolerance, to choose the rock, it's going to do a pretty good job. An additive, obviously, I can add to that mask and add some more and add some more. Then we get a nice, reasonable mask out of this with a few clicks, which couldn't necessarily have been achieved purely with a Luma range or a color selection. But that's for the rock. If I try and choose our sky out here, let's even reduce our tolerance here um, and choose along here. Well, 
Magic Brush is going to say, well, all of this stuff is really, really similar, so I'm going to try and include it all. So be careful. Um, remember that you're asking Magic Brush to choose items which are very similar. If you've got a blue sky and a blue sea, as far as Magic Brush is concerned, they may be too similar and you're going to end up with a mask that maybe could have been easier to do. This doesn't negate the use of, for instance, a gradient here. And of course, with that gradient, I could choose a Luma range and exclude all of the rock stuff here too. So the Magic Brush itself doesn't necessarily negate existing brush mechanisms or, or masking mechanisms. But in certain situations, especially with that ability to have unique brush settings on each stroke, well, we can actually get to some really complex masks really, really quickly um, as a result of that new tool. Any questions or if there's anything that we haven't covered in this setup, um, then please just put them in the comments. We'll try and answer as many as we can. But hopefully uh, for those of you that choose to upgrade or, or want to uh, move on to 21.3, there are at least some good additions in there um, that improve everyone's workflow.